and, and and as I look back on, on my career in my life, I think when you spend a, a lifetime doing and learning, it's not necessarily which decisions you made, but what you learned, what happened through that, it, it makes you the person you are today. Absolutely. Good and bad, yeah. it molds you to understand, and it all adds up. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. All right, welcome to this episode of Eco Ask Why. Today, we're digging into a fun topic that I enjoy. It's a hero episode, and, and the, the hero that we're going to sit down with today is Mr. Mike Rathman, who is the power control manager of our solution architecture group. A fun guy. Mike's brought a lot of value to several episodes that we hope that the listeners have enjoyed and, and definitely look forward to your feedback on those. Mike brings a, a ton of experience to the team. He's just a fun guy. I, uh, when I think of Mike, I think of one word, and it's passionate. Whatever he gets into, he's all in. There's no way around it. So looking forward to talking to him a little bit about his journey, how he got here, things he's experienced in the past. So welcome, Mike. And uh, if you just want to kick us off, just tell us a little bit about your journey to the role that you're, you're currently in now. Thanks, Chris, for having me. Um, I, I think I ended up where I'm at in my career, uh, knowing at a very early age that I wanted to play with electrical things. There was no doubt in my mind from the time I was probably six, seven years old that I would eventually do something with electrical, electronic things. I think the first indicator of that was one day, very young, maybe in grade school, and my father came home and found our brand new Sylvania TV set and all of its components laid out on a front living room carpet. <laughs> And the look on his face. I think that was that was the entrance. Yeah, that was the entry point. Um, that was an interesting deal. I think he was concerned whether any of us was going to figure out how to put the TV back together. I think we did get it working at some point. It's an interesting journey. I grew up in the Silicon Valley in California at the original technology boom when companies such as Commodore and Apple were just getting started there. So it was... That environment of the technology, electronics, was booming. And everybody in that geography grew up in working in that environment and the jobs associated with early technology and the, the advancements in personal computers and all those things that came along. I had my first job in that industry when I was still in high school working for the Commodore Computer Company in the very early stages of, of the early Commodore computers. So it's been a... Uh, That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was an attractive job. Not not so much now. I definitely wasn't a lead engineer at that point in time. I, I worked in the uh, cable harness shop. If you can imagine cutting wires and uh, zip tying them together for eight hours a day. A little monotonous, but that was my entrance into the uh, electronic field at that time. As I uh, got through school, through high school anyway, and started journeying into upper education. Finding that it was, in those days, was a bit of a challenge economically. I ended up joining the Navy and served in technical roles, technical technician type roles in both the electronic and electrical fields. And thank, and thank you for your service. Thank Definitely. you, thank you. Um, glad to do it. Probably one of the uh, bigger pieces of my life that grew me to, the, to what I am today, fulfilling a career in the Navy. And from there, it's been everything from, uh, I had always uh, been pretty driven to work for myself, found the opportunity to start my own integration company, um, which is really what elevated me in terms of automation, PLCs, process type work, and then ultimately found my way through reliability and at a home that's been very satisfying here at Eco for the past 10 years. That's great. Awesome journey. Since you've been here at Eco, you go see a lot of customers. You're heavily involved with the industry. Definitely are regarded as one of the experts. Our personal customers love engaging with you. What have you learned? What do you see as some of the uh, greatest challenges to industry that may be facing over the next you know, five years or so? I don't think this is anything new. There's been a lot of discussion, with, especially uh, with us working from the electrical side of a lot of processes, is 
the knowledge pool. I can remember the days working in the Silicon Valley and you would walk into a room at a company and there would be 50 engineers working um, and developing and improvements and, and all those things. And we just don't see that these days. We walk into a large manufacturer or something such as a paper mill or a processing plant. And as companies have tried to manage profitability and those things, having that kind of bandwidth there with engineers with, with a lot of experience capable of developing and improving their processes internally has effectively gone away and is now supported through third parties. I think that's the biggest thing is that knowledge gap and just the, the capacity. Having an, enough people to go about the investigations, the development of things you need to do to improve a process. Yeah, that's a definite gap. It's, it's one we're hoping to close a little bit, at least with the area that we cover and try to support in the southeast so think back to when you first started what's a piece of advice you wish someone would have gave you when you first entered the industry probably stay in school <laughs> <laughs> right you know if I would have, uh, have stayed in school early and achieved my degree I ended up taking that path much later in my career but I don't necessarily think that was a bad thing having the opportunity to get a lot of hands-on knowledge with the things that we do was beneficial. I think with me, it was easy because it was a passion, right? I'm a nerd with this stuff. I, I can sit and talk about it. I can look at the equipment, the making things work, solving the problems. I think it's easy to enjoy what you do for a lifetime if you really enjoy it, right? Absolutely. You know, I have this discussion with my son who's about at that critical point in, in, in uh, his development. He's graduating high school this year, and uh, he's about to start uh, school at the Citadel next year. And so he's following along the military lines, which we're very proud of that. And he has chosen to go down the electrical engineering field. But having, making those decisions, trying to find something that you truly are interested in, and it was easy for him. I guess it's in the blood. Right. For us. That would be my advice. It wouldn't be anything specific about what school you should go or what industry. It's try things. Talk to people and find some things. And if you find interests, then explore those. Yeah. And it makes, it's. I think that's a key to life beyond just a career, right? Yeah, no doubt. So, like, from a resource standpoint, if you, if you are, if you find yourself in, interested in a path like this, solution architecture, what are some resources that our listeners could go to and try to learn more about what this industry is and what you do? Well, obviously, you need to listen to this podcast, for starters. Right. Well, that's number one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, with the ability to uh, just put out information through the technologies that we're all absorbed in right now, through social media right now, it's so easy in my eyes, to look and to explore beyond the traditional, I've got to sign up for a, a program at a university. Explore what's out there. Talk to a few boomers that have, that have lived this life. I know that's not, uh, as my son would call me, uh, whatever boomer in most topics. I think we still carry a lot of knowledge and experience that we could pass on and maybe uh, give some guidance to. Yeah. But uh, to me, looking at what's available in this time, it's almost endless, right? There's so few barriers to being able to look and and explore and educate yourself that there's nothing that should hold somebody back from finding what their passion is. Absolutely. When you say sharing that information, I was, I'm, I'm thinking influencers. If you were to think back over your, your career or just life in general, Name a couple. I mean, this is an opportunity to, to give some praise to some people who have been a, a pretty good influence to you in your life or mentors, if you will. Who would they be? For me, that would be a long list. Uh, as my career has gone through from my military career, that's really a long list there of, of mentors that helped drive me through that part of my career. Anybody you know, stand out on that list? Yeah, I would say... An initial instructor, as I got into my early, the very early side of, of my technical instruction in the Navy, there was an instructor who was, who was pretty critical to it. What I found when we went and started going through that technical instruction in the Navy, it's like going to an advanced uh, university course 
that would typically take you two to four years, and they're going to slam it through a uh, fire hose. And in a term of about six to eight weeks. Oh, wow. Right. And, and encompass something that may take you several semesters to do. And I like to think of myself as, as fairly smart in these areas. But that was a challenge. So what was a day like there? What time did it start? When did it end? What was a typical day when in that time? A typical day when you're in that instruction environment going to one of the technical schools is you're studying a subject in a classroom for eight hours a day five to six days a week. And what could be more challenging about, depending on the subject matter that you were um, working with, sometimes that meant that your materials from the classroom had to stay in the classroom. And you could spend four to six hours after school kind of in a study hall. So your learning is a full-time job. So you couldn't take the materials out? In some cases, yes, based on the subject matter. So it really is a full-time job. So just the math you just did, that's 12 to 13 hours a day of, of nothing but hitting the books. Correct. you got to fix some food in there somewhere. Yeah, and they do. Um, you know, that's what marching is for. Hey. <laughs> you would march to the food. But that environment really sets you up. And that was my challenge, getting back to that, is being able to – it wasn't necessarily the level of the material, but how much you had to consume. Absolutely. And that was one of the challenges for me initially. And the leading instructor that I was working under at that point in time really had to pull me out. I think he seen the technical ability I naturally had in this area, but had to convince me that it was consumable to some degree. So what's like the completion rate for – Programs like that, is it a pretty high dropout? Did, did most of the guys finish? It sounds extremely difficult to get through that. It really does vary as that subject matter shifts to specialties with within, quote unquote, the engineering skills trades. But you could typically see this is an ongoing process in these technical instructions, right, in the schools. And they could be fulfilling a class every six weeks, every two months. But in general, you could see an attrition rate of anywhere from 30% to 50% of the class. Wow. For, for a variety of reasons. You just can't get through the material or just can't stick with it long enough. It just sounds grueling. You know? It could be. It, at times it was. I say grueling. You're in a classroom. but it's. Uh, yeah, I'm comparing it to my experience at Old Dominion. And I thought that was tough. And it was definitely had its moments where... You just have this feeling, can I do this? But it sounds like this was was probably, you know, amp that up a little bit. When you're motivated in a military environment to succeed as well, so the uh, some of the freedoms that that you enjoyed probably at Old Dominion after you were out of class weren't necessarily translated to that military environment, right? (laughs) Right. You're not as exposed to to some of the things that would take you away from it as much. I'll I'll admit this, man. over the years, the hires we've had together, we've worked together on a lot of projects. But the personnel with the military experience, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It teaches, obviously, the, just the values and the work ethic. It, it's, it is something we definitely support, no doubt. So well, Thank you for that, Chris. It goes a long ways. Yeah, absolutely. But it translates. It does translate. No doubt. So that, we've looked back for a while. So now let's look to the future. You're involved in some pretty cool stuff. What excites you about the future? There's really, what I've seen is the convergence of technology right now down to things that are as simple as power. And the basic gray boxes of yesteryear that, that hung around these industrial plants that just did a very basic function, turned a light on or started a motor. The movement of technology for the whatever you want to call it, Industry 4.0 or LLOT and all these things we're seeing, there is reality to that right now where things are really becoming connected. The ability to make this process or this thing work in conjunction with that to enhance capabilities in production, efficiencies, and all these things, 
a lot of the barriers that were associated with technologies of even just 10 years have been blown up. And we're even moving quickly beyond that is you start exploring some of the some of the visualization capability, augmented reality, digital twins. These things are at the forefront now are just amazing to look at and how they can impact what you do. And especially for me being older and seeing the regression where uh, doing maintenance tasks and repairing and designing and building things 30 years ago was a very manual, intensive process. Technology now is really opening that up, that the ability to have all the information and the things that you need to consider at your fingertips at any point in time and to be able to manipulate that is, is extremely powerful. So that's where I get a, a lot of the enjoyment right now. I think bringing high-level visualization is something that I'm really keen on and working with right now. So that whatever it is you're working with, whether it's a, a power plant, an industrial facility, and you've got the power infrastructure and all of that there, the ability now to have that information visualized in front of you for instant understanding and diagnostics it's pretty cool. So that's where you get your kicks at. That's, that's right. a lot of it. That's really an enjoyable piece of where we're at right now. That's awesome. That is really great. So there are a lot of myths out there about engineering, what we do, how things get done. What's a common myth you like to debunk? You got the platform now. What's something you like to, to say, hey, this is what people think we do, but this is not reality. I think I'd equate that to a conversation I had with my son early on as he went into high school. I've done a lot of travel. It just That's the way my career has developed where I'd work on projects a lot. And he never really considered me an engineer because in his eyes I was going out fixing things. Okay. And I still I, I equate that as when I was growing up. When somebody said an engineer, I thought more of like my dad at AT&T, sitting in an office with a pipe and a big CAD board, drawing and designing this thing. And I don't know if that's everybody else's myth, but I, I always had that kind of a picture. That's what an engineer was. Kind of spent my career fixing things, right, and, and solving things, and then woke up and real, realized I was an engineer. But I don't necessarily sit at, at, at a big whiteboard and design things on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, absolutely. So you've done some pretty cool things in your engineering career. What's a highlight that you'd like to share of something, a, maybe a cool project or something, a process, whatever it may be, just a highlight that you'd like to share with the listeners? Um, going back sometime, I think this really speaks to me as I started first creating my own integration company and got involved in the automotive industry very specifically and worked with a large tier one companies in, in that industry and was able to put together a project here in the United States that would, at this time was the largest automated stamping system, which for if you're not familiar with that industry, basically takes big chunks of steel and forms them into a, that piece part that goes into a car. Okay. And I think I was a little bit fortunate just through the people that I knew and was working with that I was able to be uh, intrinsic in that project. It was actually documented on one of those discovery shows at one time. The, how, how does this work? Okay. This was done back in the 90s. So that was significant. And I didn't even realize really how significant it was at the time until we actually started getting the feedback of there is no other system in, in the United States that had the capability of that system. Wow. So that was definitely a highlight. I've still got pictures of that one hanging in my office. That is pretty cool, man. So you look back on that and, and feel a lot of joy, I'm sure. That's great. So let's talk about Mike outside of work, man. Outside. Any, hob any hobbies, anything like that you like to do when you're not fixing the world's problems of power and power management? Besides being an electrical and electronic nerd, I do have two other passions, and both started very early as well. Probably the first one was golf. Okay. Um, and to this day, I'm an avid golfer. Both my parents golf. My father actually was a semi-pro golfer that played on a little California tour when I was young. Really? Okay. Either that or they just gambled and drank and played golf. I'm not sure, but <laughs> he was always golfing. Right. Some of that extent. But So my parents introduced me to golfing at a very early age. I was 
I probably got my first golf club when I got my first bicycle. So I was playing golf at a very early age. And I've carried that on even through my Navy career. When we leave on deployment, I'd have my sea bag with me and my golf bag with me. I've actually been able to play golf overseas in a couple of different places. So I still carry that on. I try to play as much golf as I'm allowed now. Absolutely. Um, music's always been very big to me. I think as most, for a lot of people in my generation, you either play guitar or you played guitar. That was pretty much it. At a young age, played in bands, played guitar, sung. I'm still do a little bit of that now, nowhere near as much. But I've been able to pass that along to my son as well. Uh, a typical Friday night at the Raffin House is the amps get turned up and the music gets loud. And my son and I have that ability to interact through music that's pretty powerful. That's great. I, I just I remember your son probably... When you first started here, maybe nine years ago coming, and to the man he's grown into now, just the relationship you guys have, for me, it's, it's a role model for, for just how tight you guys are. I, I hope my daughters, we grow to have the relationship you guys have one day. But when I see the videos you have of you and him jamming out together, and that's just, that's just too cool. It really I is. am blessed in that aspect. Having the relationship I do with my son is 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 everything absolutely man absolutely i got one more question and right. then i'll let you off the hook so if you were step in my shoes what would you have asked yourself that i didn't you know i think a question we always ask ourselves would you have done it differently okay and i do ask myself that question there was a fork in the road a couple forks in the road making the decision to join the military i look back on it now as is the best, one of the best decisions i ever made in my life but at that same time, I was really involved in music, and it could have just as easily, I could have said, no, nah, I want to try and be in music, and who knows where that would have led. So I probably made the right decision <laughs> with that one, right? I don't know, Mike. I'm telling you, with your passion, I think whichever path you take, even from your past and in the, in the future, you're going to be successful, man. You, I appreciate that. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's nice to feel that you can drive and just do what you want to do and do what's important to you, what would make sense. But that, that's a pretty important question. And, and, and as I look back on, on my career and my life, I, I think when you spend a, a lifetime doing and learning, it's not necessarily which decisions you made, but what you learned, what happened through that, it, it makes you the person you are today. Absolutely. Good and bad. Yeah. It molds you to understand, and it all adds up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I think this has been great. Hopefully it gives our listeners a little bit more of the insight of, to you and your world. And you brought some great information to listeners on previous episodes. So thank you for that as well. But I uh, just really enjoy sitting down. Looking forward to working with you for hopefully many more years in the future. And you're just, just a great man. Oh, thank you, Chris. And hey, to any of our listeners out there, I do live in Pinehurst. So any of you golf junkies that are out there, feel free. Send me a note. There's generally an open tee time. I'm looking forward to seeing you out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I don't play golf, but I'm going to have to take you up on that just to ride around in a cart with you for a few hours. That's always needed. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.